I, I sent Bill on a trajectory that I didn't realize until he was mid-story. There was a summer where you stayed the entire summer, and that's probably what I was referencing. The, the summer where you and Dick stayed back and actually welded projects like this out in the summer sun. I think that they don't have a record of it, but I think the temperature was 123 degrees in the daytime. So we'd get about 6.30 or so, and maybe earlier than that. Aunt Sophie was uh, uh, Mrs. Wright's, uh, well, her husband was Uncle Bado, and that was his wife. And she would fix breakfast, or fix lunch and dinner for us. We had to tackle our own breakfast, but uh, we could work about 10 or 11. It was just too hot. And we'd take off. We'd take turns on showing whoever showed up to take a tour. I think we charged five dollars a tour because that's what we lived on. <laughs> and, uh, and so we we would assign duties who was going to take them. And uh, I was with my daughter Tara uh, when she was going to college, and uh, she was driving for me. I was working for a different company, and we showed up and. Uh, first person we saw was John Rettenbury. And I started, he said, I remember you. He said, there's a handful, handful of people, of all the people that's been through here. We both remember you and Armand. That's what Dick was called, was, was Armand. And because there's already a couple of Dicks around here. <laughs> so, uh, that was a great treat to have him mention that. Uh, where were we going with that? <laughs> you're on your own. Oh, okay. I can set you on a new course. Well, so you know, we can talk about this. Yeah. That's my son, Gabriel. He's supposed to be here. He's uh, 60 years old today, <laughs> or the spring. And uh, uh, we lived, Annie and I lived out in the desert in a tent. And he had these little narrow paths about this wide. We didn't have a stroller, you didn't, you couldn't use one there. It was too wide, it was too much desert and cactus along the way. So I took some an old tricycle apart and took the springs out and made it spring loaded at the back and, and took some uh, uh, steel conduit and made the handle and some scrap plywood and made him a seat. And so we used that to go up and down the paths out in the middle of the desert. And uh, that's the grandson of the guy that did the engineering for Mr. Wright on the uh, a hotel in Japan. Yeah, Imperial Hotel. And uh, Mr. Wright saw that and he thought that was a pretty cool invention. So anyway, that's out at Talias and West. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry, Gabe's not here. <laughs> when when I uh, first met Bill, one of the curiosities is um, certainly to have him share stories about his time with Mr. Wright, but then it's, well, what did you learn from that? How did you gain from that experience, and how did you put it into practice? And so my fascination with San Diego architecture actually starts in part with this really, really cool house in Kona uh, on the west coast of the Big Island of Hawaii. Uh, so Ken Kellogg, a San Diego architect at the time, a native of Mission Beach, Jim Hubble, who had graduated from Cranbrook uh, and moved to San Diego, and Bill, who had recently left Taliesin, um, all joined together in this fascinating project. And this is um, a picture of uh, a shirtless strapping uh, Bill Slatton here in about 1962 uh, as the project is under construction. And, <laughs> and, and so he's, he's part and parcel of this project, though Ken Kellogg gets you know, the lion's share of the credit for the architecture. The steel structure actually is is quite quite impressive, um, and Bill, you you three young guys in your twenties on the west coast of Hawaii, hanging out making a very progressive project for the for its time and even today. Can you tell us about what your days were like with these other guys, the laborers, and and just what it was like to build the Onion House, which I'm going to go to a picture of. Well, I'll start off by saying when we got the permit, which we had to get it over in Hilo, because uh, the island of uh, Hawaii is all one county. And so the building department was over there, and we, we showed there, and he's a 
Japanese guy and a civil engineer. And he said, well, who are you going to have build this? And we said, we are. He said, oh, you know how to do something like this? We should sure work, you know it. He said, that's a good thing because we don't have any contractors. Anybody over here knows how to do something like that. And so we asked him about getting inspections. And he said, well, when you get a puka or the septic tank, which is an eight-foot round hole in the ground, you go down at least eight feet. And if you had a big lava <coughs> tube, you can quit. They call me up and that'll be your septic tank. <laughs> so, 14 months later, we called him up and said, we've got the puka. So he, he came over and looked at that and we had completely built the house. But he showed up a half a dozen times he said, not official, not official. He just wanted to look around and see what we were doing. And so, anyway, we lived on the site for uh, a fellow named Carla there in Phoenix and sold the property to Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Von Beck. And so he had a house down in the beach and we stayed down there a while and he finally we gave that up and we built a little shack on the on the site. And we stayed there for a week or two and then we decided, well, there was a shipping strike, we couldn't get materials and we we had to do rock work. We had many rock work so we doing most of the rock till we wait on materials. And uh, so we realized our family needed to come over, so I came over and Jen. And, uh, I had a, I bought an old War, World War II Army Jeep, which to be used for the garbage scow in Kona. And it was pretty eaten out at the back, so I ordered some metal and rebuilt that, and I had to use that for her limousine carrying the kids around. And Tara was a diaper baby at the time, and she made a lot of friends over there. and. Uh, it was like uh, most of the, we had a few workers in Hawaii, but they they liked to do the tourist jobs where they were mostly showing people around. They didn't care for doing the hard work. And so the people available to do it were Filipino farmers. They grew Kona coffee. And the older ones were the best one because they really needed the money. And we paid them time and a half on Saturday. I think we paid a dollar ten cents an hour at the time. And uh, they would come Saturday, they'd come work all week to get that time and a half. I mean, that would have been a lot to them. So Ken would take the thing one weekend, and I would take it the next weekend. But we really just kind of built it around the clock when we felt like it, you know, at least eight hours a day. And uh, most everything was hauled in on the uh, fiberglass panels, the arches. They were shipped in from New York. The, the longest one was 60 feet long. And they had to be shipped through the Panama Canal because they didn't have it on the on the West Coast. And uh, uh, let's see, most of the things were made there. We had redwood that was tough to get what we wanted, but we the little mini arches that go around about every four feet you see there. Uh, uh, they were out of redwood, and they had to put we had reinforcing in the concrete beams, and we had a bar at the top, and I could weld in and put a strap on it. To hook these panels on, and so we had we built one uh, one beam at a time, and we figured out which one was the longest, and that's the one we built the form, and we poured concrete with it, and let it sit overnight. Maybe I think we let it sit two days, then we strip it and we'll set up the next longest one and run them around. So we used the same form for all of them, and uh, uh, so anyway, we just. Uh, the, uh, the work laborers were all Filipino, like I said, but they didn't speak English except for one or two of the young kids. So we just, I would get out and make samples on the walls and get them started. And they'd go out and gather rock. You guys didn't do anything but gather rock off of all the properties for a whole year. And nobody, nobody wanted to keep the rock anyway, so. And we were probably about six or eight house in this subdivision, something like that. And, uh, uh, anyway, it was a great summer, great vacation. We got a great job on that house. Uh, Mrs. Von Beck came over several times, and uh, we put a speaker in the swimming pool, and she was delighted when she came over. And she had a she had an open house which lasted three days, <laughs> and she bought a bunch of wine, and we cooked a, a big pig below the luau pig. We dug a pit out there about six feet deep red rocks and everything and wrapped it up and built a big fire and dropped it in there and left it overnight. And so the workers 
some of them worked with their friends. They would come the next day, and, and he'd go to the regular job, and he'd come back at night and swim in the pool. And, you know, it was just a one long party for three days. You know, it, was a, it was tremendous. And so, anyway, Ken and I had a great time. And Jim Hubble came over about the last two weeks, and he did all this classwork in the last two weeks. Most of these classwork panels, uh, you can show some of those. Uh, uh, the glasswork is on three dimensions. It had to go two directions at once, three directions at once. So they all were built on a curve into the, the main arch and the concrete beam and so forth. And the same way as the steel doors and stuff, I had to build all the doors and frames on steel. And they had to be tapered just right at the top and everything to be able to close. And, uh, anyway, Ken and I remember one thing. Uh, we had a, a, a big arch dividing the main house from the second bed, the main bedroom. And there was a pond of water there, and a big long arch. So we reinforced it on the top and poured the concrete, put rock on it, and then it set for a week or two. And then we stripped the farms off. Ken and I looked at each other, and we both had the same idea. We ran over the wall and went on top of this arch, and we ran up there and jumped on the arch. And all these guys thought it would fall down. But I think we're waiting for it to fall. Uh, that was one of the things I remember pretty well. And, and the, I, I said, I made some um, references earlier to how, I mean, obviously how Bill came to be here, but how the show at the La Jolla Historical Society came to be, but ultimately how I even heard about Bill, which is uh, a friend of mine was on a cul-de-sac several years ago, and he came upon this house at the end of a hardly paved road, barely paved road, and and he had introduced himself at the door to Mrs. McWhorter, who was still living in the house. She's still living in the house. And and she said, I, you know, my friend said, who is the architect of your house? And she said, oh, this guy, Bill, or Billy, as Bill is often referred to, uh, Billy Slatton did this. And we had not heard that name at that point in our interest in, in local architecture. And she said, oh, well, you know, something about Frank Lloyd Wright, something about Ken Kellogg, something about Jim Hubble, something about Harold Abrams, something about... And so Bill, before I actually met him and we, we tracked each other down and, and had our first conversation, um, I had known about this house, which is sort of a fact, right? It's just a, one single fact. But all the, sur the surrounding variables and how to connect the dots to him, where he was, who he was, was actually quite a mystery for a number of months. But my friend, upon first knocking on this door, was so taken by the house, he's like, there's something here. We've got to find this guy. We've got to meet this guy. We've got to learn his story. And, and you know, this is 10, 12 years ago. So we're here today because, and thankfully, Mrs. McWhorter invited me over, and we took some fabulous photos. So the interesting thing about Bill is a lot of the Taliesin apprentices that left Frank Lloyd Wright's employment went on to pretty significant coffee table-like book careers. And Bill did some welding, you know, some work for different architects, but you didn't do a lot of projects as a soloist. And this house really sings. Do you, do you have any recollections about how this house kind of created this little bit of a legacy for you here in town? Well, um, Louise McWhorter was the daughter of Dr. Edel. And Lloyd Rocco, I worked for him at that time, and he did, we did the drawings for Dr. Edel's house. He was a college professor back in some place, a famous college back east, I don't remember which one. But uh, I, I did the supervision on there and the question and answer stuff in there. And that's how Louise got to know me. And, so she was going to hire an architect to do their house. She said, oh, you got to call Bill up. He's, a, he's very hands-on. Uh, he'll do a great job for you. And so she called me, and we went down the three ways. And, uh, uh, her husband was Mac McCorder. He was the first ace, I guess, in World War II in the Pacific. And he was the, uh, uh, the second ace as well. And he died a couple of years ago. But um, uh, anyway, I did the drawings for the house and we uh, got started. And 
Lo and behold, the, the uh, contractor built the roof upside down. <laughs> and, uh, so I said, well, yeah, you know, I don't know if we can tolerate that or not. And the next day he committed suicide. So Mac had to go ahead and finish the house. And, uh, but he decided there's a way we can keep this without having to tear that down. He said, I don't have money to tear it down. So I reworked the drawings enough to where we made it work. And of course, uh, Louise and her children didn't even know about that. But so the roof is not quite what I had in mind. It, it was kind of like a, a folded roof, you might say. Went up and down in certain places. And we were supposed to go up, went down. And then my... Uh, so we, and she didn't have money to finish off the kitchen part. We got a flat deck inside, suspended from the upper roof, and, and she didn't have money for that. But the nature of the house was that she wanted to be part of everything that was going on. So the dining room was around the edge of a sunken fireplace, looking at the fireplace, looking at the fireplace. And they had a pull out one of his uh, uh, planes over in, in, uh, in Japan on the mantle. And uh, so that's the way I left it. We, uh, I think, and I think her brother, her brother, uh, Joe, came over to stay with us one summer, and I designed some light fixtures, and Joe built all the light fixtures in the house. We went over late in the evening and hung them up, and she called me back. And she said, "Well, I was expecting some light fixtures that line up so we can read." And she said, "All you've done is illuminate the place." So I, I, I don't know, I guess we didn't shake hands on that, but that's what I had in mind was an indirect illumination like we would do. So I think a great little... Part. How many square feet is the house? Pardon me? How many square feet is the house? I don't know. 2,500 maybe, something like that. They had a workshop down below. And originally it was designed to be... Um, uh, we were going to leave the soil alone. I was going to set up kind of on the stilts for part of it. And uh, the money came, the price came in too high, so uh, we graded it and put in a, a flat slab for it. And then we didn't start a building. But uh, she was always going to do something else, but we, we never did. It just pretty much stayed the same. But uh, I think her children still live there. And uh, they would be, what, 60 years old now, maybe? I didn't do but one or two other houses in San Diego, but I did a lot of uh, a lot of uh, condominium projects. You know, they four stories high and two levels of parking garages, and you send the flight path as you fly into San Diego Airport. And there's, I don't know, the other ones are located around mostly in uh, in uh, Billcrest, up in that area. But uh, I never did do one doing more houses. But I worked for Lock Crane, I did one for him, and one for, uh, I did the, the Methodist Church for, uh, they borrowed Western when I was there, just down the street there, in the Bird Rock, and it, uh, it spans a street, which they dedicated back to the their project, so we had a piece of mail to go through all the city records to get all of the columns and everything located where they could get in there with the backhoe, and, the main sewer. The train station for the trolley that went back and forth. So that's in the building in the back. And all along that street back there, which was part of the trolley, the surveyor had made a six foot vertical elevation mistake. And you know, it's about seven or eight hundred feet there. So I was down there trying to resolve the problem. I said, you know, there's something wrong here. So I got on the hand level, so I called the surveyor back, and they had forgotten to subtract the height of the instrument from their survey. So they were six feet off. So, anyway, uh, I did quite a few projects at Weaver. Most of we did the, uh, the Hawaii Beach and Tennis Club at the time. And uh, uh, I was kind of a troubleshooter. And we were doing the working drawings, and they were starting to build the uh, we had a foundation permit. And my killer was a contractor. We'd call up and say, well, you got a problem down here in this corner. We need to end them down. I said, well, how, how soon do I need to be there? He said, well, the, trunk, the concrete truck's backing up right now. you got to get in a hurry. So I would run down there and solve that problem. But 
And then uh, I worked with Homer Dunaway for quite a while, twice really. And he built the five story building just down in the Hoya Shores. And uh, uh, I was usually doing the uh, field supervision on a number of his jobs, I do the estimating. And uh, so I worked with Homer a long time. We did some work with uh, uh, Esther and Davis. Yeah, we did. That was a contemporary of his. They would get jealousy of who was doing what. We did a lot of work at the zoo. Uh, I'd usually start off my day for about a year or so going by the zoo and, and changing drawings because being a city project, we didn't have to get to the, They'd just shop drawings one day and they'd be building it the next day. So whatever changes you had to make, you had to go out to the job and make the changes. You, know, you didn't have time to turn them back in. So that was always fun. Um, so I wanted to take some time to engage you all. Um, I'm sure there's a question or two out there. Um, on behalf of the McWhorter family, uh, it is true, the entire family still lives under this roof. Many kids have actually left, built lives for themselves and moved back under, under mom's roof. Um, Mr. McWhorter was um, a very key World War II fighter ace that returned to San Diego under a great deal of, of uh, fanfare, actually. It was not without, uh, the moment you walk in the house, there are photographs of he and his World War II fighters all over there. It's almost a memorial. Um, the light fixtures, the house, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a wonderful museum and a testament to Bill working with a family who decades later continues to very much enjoy the house. And I think that's really, really something special about it. Any? Whereabouts in El Cajon is it? It is on, what is the hill called? Um, Mount Merritt. It's on Mount Merritt. Yeah. So it's Chase Avenue all the way east. Yeah, yeah, almost to Avocado. Yes, question. You mentioned something in Hillcrest. Where in Hillcrest? Like, yes, yes. So, yes. So the question is, uh, what did you build in Hillcrest, Bill? Uh, condominiums. Uh, I forget the address of them, but they were up on uh, 6th Avenue and 5th uh, Avenue, up near University, I guess it would be. Near University? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We did one that they poured the foundations, and the owners were writing the financiers around. And they came up to see what they had done. So it was 13 stories high, and they had a tremendous amount of concrete for this 13 story building. And so they picked the guys up and they brought them out there, and they, they were talking about how much money they were going to make on this project, and the guys canceled their loan. So they had to operate all this concrete. They eventually had to tear it out because the zoning had changed since uh, they started building. And you no longer could build anything with three units on the lot. So it killed the whole project. Uh, I want to tell you something. I keep looking next door. And I see this building next door. It to a guy named Shepard, Tom Shepard, who's an architect here. And we had an office up there. And... Uh, and Bob Rosenthal was the architect there, and I did engineering for him and supervision. And uh, actually, we did most of the draft, but he had a lady that worked for us. And we probably with the Historical Society I remember Zoltan uh, Rosniai. You remember that name, anybody? Zoltan Rosniai, he was the director of the San Diego Sympathy. Yeah. So his wife, Mimi, was our draft lady. And uh, she had a very very broad English, but very educated. <laughs> she called one day and said, and she's always at work on time. She said, I can't come into work, somebody have to pick me up. So I go and pick her up and I said, what's wrong? She said, well, I called the mechanic. And he said, the engine was missing. I said, well, God, we could fix that. And going. so I opened the hood up and the engine, <laughs> the engine was missing. <laughs> somebody had taken her on a Volkswagen Bud. And taking the, oh, taking the engine out last night. Uh, <laughs> so that was me, me, Rose. Now, there's a question over here. So, what's been your uh, background? What's motivated you to share your 
So the question is, uh, what led you to apply originally for the Taliesin apprenticeship? What what motivated you? What drove you to that initial phase? Well, I had been interested in architecture since I was in high school. And I said, you know, I'm going to be an architect one day. Uh, and then the war came along and I had to go into service. And my best buddy was Dick Ballert. And his grandfather was the engineer for Wright back in Chicago. And uh, his mother wrote to Mr. Wright. And and so that's why we went there, because of that association with Dick. It's too bad he's not here, because uh, uh, Dick was probably the most controversial person that ever showed up at Taliesin, you know. And uh, I remember uh, when John Randomary said, there's two people that nobody could forget. That was you and, you, you and Armand. And, uh, we stayed back that summer to rebuild the graphic room, and we would walk around there with, uh, during the daytime showing you the tourist around and taking a nap. Uh, we'd walk around with a bathing suit on, maybe a hat, <laughs> and we had a, a six-shooter, six guns, six guns, you know, and that was on purpose for rattlesnakes and stuff. And uh, one of the stories, Dick was walking along between the night and the bushes there, and uh, he, he went like that. Oh, he said. And so, out, 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 out the rattlesnake's head, and he pulled out a gun and said, Bang! Okay, come on now. <laughs> so, that, that story permeated the uh, Taliesin theme, everybody's what he did all his life. <laughs> he left early and was, uh, uh, he became a carpenter. And then he became kind of a manager of big, large uh, condominium projects, like three or four hundred units. And people would hire him, he would, they would get in trouble with either the labor or getting finished on time, and they would hire Dick to come in and take over. And he'd get it reorganized and back on track, and he'd get a good bonus for doing it. And he worked there doing that, he worked in Alaska one time, when the work was slow here. He worked in uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky one time, when the work was slow here. And he went back and reorganized an entire huge project for the Army. That was the they were in trouble on, and he set up a pre assembled plant about 20 miles away and pre assembled some of the buildings and all of them. It's too bad he's not here to talk about some of that. Yeah. There's a question here, and then I'll take a question. Yes. Can you say something about whether when Frank Lloyd Wright was working the houses, whether there was a massive building, whether he had a little bit more of the process going with it? I think. So the question is, uh, using the, the onion house as an example of the project being about as much the process as it is about the drawings and or the materials, but the camaraderie we discussed with you and Ken and the team in Kona, did you learn a bit through your time with Wright about the process of building, yielding a, a project on the other end of that process? Well, it was kind of done by being there uh, and living with it. And I wrote a, in this book here, well, that's not it, the one that uh, Francis Nintman put out called uh, Let Dear Mr. Wright. And I, she published my letter in that book. And it had to do with his philosophy on life and how it went about. And he used to say in there, there's a little, uh, little breakfast talk on that. And one of them was, um, you know, you need to get it in your, he said, I don't expect you boys to do that, but uh, you need to get this in your mind. He said, I, I envision the project all in my mind completely before I ever put down a line on, put on the paper. And he said, if you just follow your instincts, if you'll follow here, Get that in your mind, and get the project in your mind, and then start putting it on there. And he talked about some guy that he knew that he said, you know, you can always race stuff, but he said, if you got it in your mind, you know what you're doing. You don't have to race very much. He said uh, one of the fellows used to be he started out with a smudge and he would race for the lines were going to go. And he said, I don't think that's the way to do it. 
and so that's why some of the work is kind of poor. But, uh, mainly he talked about solving the parking problem first for our commercial building, building codes, and working on the building and keep that in mind. Uh, he said, just follow your heart and, and take what you learn here and use that. He said, you can't go put too far wrong. So it's kind of about what we learned about life while we were there. That throughout your career, you can play the, the architecture you're doing. Is that a question here? Yeah, I'm from uh, Birmingham, Michigan. And in Bloomfield, Michigan, there's a cul-de-sac that has three Lloyd Wright homes there. I think the fellow, one of them was lived in by a fellow named Harold who was either worked at Lloyd Wright one time or something. And he either built them because a friend of mine lived in one of them. And they were all, I just looked up, there's one of them, I don't know if this is one of the houses, but Melvin Maxwell and Sarah Smith, Stein Smith House, which is on the historic registry now, is a... Is a you know, it's one of those houses, I think. Do you know anything about the houses in Michigan on the cul-de-sac? No. But anyway, probably do have I'd have to see the picture before I Okay. I heard that the cul-de-sac is really important for as part of the curriculum, designed their own domicile and lived in it. Could you tell us about any of that? So when the apprentices lived on site, they had to, to create what you created, which was a tent. Mm -hmm. Anne might want to chime in here because I think some lizards and some bugs got in uh, off the desert floor. But yes, they, they, they lived in a, in a project they built themselves. You want to talk about your, your building of your tent? When you first moved in there, you would have heard of a, a little three pong thing that was nine feet high and a canvas ship. And there was usually somebody's place that they built first. And while you were living there, you could, uh, um, well, you have to get permission to get material and stuff, design your own tent. And I was really never, never there long enough uh, to do that. So I lived in a structure that somebody else built, and I was always helping somebody else build their tent, you know. Uh, and then Annie and I lived in one, and we had a, a, a baby bed that her father gave her, and it was completely screened in on the bottom, the sides, and the top. Keep the mosquitoes and stuff out. And we had to set up little coffee cans and fill with water to keep the scorpions from coming up and going out. So that was in the middle of our tent. We had a bed on each side, but anyway. I think we've been doing this for almost an hour and a half, so uh, maybe stand up to do some stretching and you can talk to Bill one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, uh, Dennis has a bunch of write-related materials and books for sale. This is a bookstore, after all. And I want to thank you on my behalf, but certainly let's all thank Bill. Thank you all so much for coming on this one. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much.